you begin to think about you're saved today, it's well with your soul. Amen. But if you're not saved, it's not well. Yeah. It's not well with your soul. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 22 this morning. Genesis chapter 22. If you would please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able to. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Verse 1 says, and it, be, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto, unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb, for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to a place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon thy, the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day in the, Mount of God, in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. If you would look back at verse 8, it says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. I'd like to preach to you the God-given lamb. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we do thank you for the Lamb of God. Lord, that we might have eternal life. There may be some here today that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If they was to die, they don't know that they'd go to heaven. Lord, I pray that they would, Lord, repent of their sin and turn their hearts and lives over to you and receive you as their Savior today. Lord, I ask that we as Christians, Lord, that as we look at this this morning, Lord, that it might stir our hearts to live for you in a greater way that we might worship you even as Abraham went forward to, mount, to the mount, Lord, to, to worship you there that day. Lord, I pray that we would worship you. And Lord, that we'd lift you up. Lord, we do pray for Brother Gibson and his family. Lord, with the loss of their home and stuff, Lord, thank you for protecting them. Things can be replaced. But Lord, I pray that you'd meet their every need. Help us to do what we can to help them be a blessing to them. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with those who are struggling, Lord, here today and have needs in their lives. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. you be seated. We see a picture of the Lamb from Genesis to Revelations. And that Lamb is not just any Lamb, but it is a Lamb without spot and without blemish. It's Jesus Christ. Many times we fail to see and understand what was done that we might have eternal life. You see, Hebrews 9, 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. It says, And without shedding of blood is no remission. There had to be the blood shed for you and I. 
This, uh, uh, some people may call it a bloody religion, but my friend, understand, it took sinless blood to cover your sins, to wash away your sins and mine. That's right. And without that, we have absolutely nothing. I want us to look at the Lamb today and realize the importance of the God-given Lamb for you and me. First of all, the, the very much needed question that Isaac asked here should be asked in your life and my life also. Notice what he said in verse 7. In the latter part of that verse, well, let me just read it. It says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, uh, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where's the lamb? Isaac noticed something. He said, you know, we got the wood here. We've got the fire. And I understand what making a, a, a sacrifice is, Father. And, and I understand that we can't just give anything. I understand that it's got to be a lamb. And he said, we've got all this, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Could I ask you this morning, in your life, Where's the lamb? Where is the lamb? It's a good question to ask each of us in, in our own lives and understand this morning. You see, because without the lamb, you have no forgiveness of sin. Without the lamb, there, you have no substitute for, your, for your, the penalty of sin. Without the lamb, you have no cleansing of sin. And so this morning, could I ask you, where's the lamb in your life? Now, when I speak of the lamb, I'm speaking of the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So where's the lamb in your life? He's, he's just, is he just merely a name to you or uh, someone has spoken of in church, or is he the Savior which you've received? Amen. What is he to you this morning? Is he the lamb of God, or is he just a lamb? Many times today I find that in... All the religion that we have today in most people's lives, it's just another lamb. Just another lamb. Consider the lamb of God this morning. Consider the provision of that lamb that was made. In verse 8 says, Abraham's son, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a, a burnt offering. So they both went, uh, both of them, uh, of them together. We find that God, he said, God will provide. He made the provision. And he's making wants to make the provision for you and I. This man stands powerless in the face of sin today. Every person in this room, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't have, matter what kind of a, a person you may think you are. My friend, I want you to understand something. You're a, you're a sinner. Amen. I'm a sinner. And it's only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that that sin can be washed away. Man, through the fall of Adam there, in the garden there... Man ruined man. We live in ruins today and we look around and we see all kinds of junk happening all around us and we, we see the depravity of man and all the, the things that's happening. In the, we see it on the papers, we see it in the news, we see it all around. And that's the depravity of man. That is sin that has racked the, the lives of man from, from the garden until this day and because of man's sin. You see, many times we try to Changed the ruin of man by rebuilding him, that ruined life, with programs. The government has programs and different agencies have programs and trying to straighten out man and trying to make him better. But it's never worked. There's no program can change what's inside of you. The only thing that can change you as a, as a ruined man, as a sinner, is the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Man is in rebellion and unable to bring an end to his rebellion. You know, a lot of... I was talking with Janine last night, and, and you know, a, a lot of people are really enamored with uh, 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 Donald Trump for president. And I mean, they're excited. And, and you know why? I'm going to tell you why. It's because he's saying what a lot of us would like to say. Really. I mean, he's, he's not part of the political establishment and stuff. And so he's saying things that, that a lot of us want to hear said. And he's making a, you know, a big deal out of it. But could I tell you one thing? I look at the man's life and I'm thinking, and I know, uh, and not just now, but what is in previous to that, what, why is the man really even running for president? Ego. Ego. 
say, oh, Preacher, you better not put this on, on YouTube. That doesn't matter. I've never been politically correct. Don't plan on starting now. <laughs> but you know what? That's why a lot of people run for it. Not just Donald Trump. I'm not saying everybody, but many. It's ego. And a lot of what's taking place and what's being said and everything, you know what it is? It's a form of, it's a form of rebellion. We many times, there's that rebel in all of us. You may, some of you ladies sitting there looking so sweet and everything, there's a rebel inside you, I know there is. I mean, if we just push the right button, it's going to come up. And every one of us, there is rebellion in every single one of us. And we battle with those things. And it's because of sin. It's because of the wickedness of our hearts and the... And, 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 and all the things that's in our lives that keeps us uh, stirred. And, and, and there's only one thing that can be, you know, and we've tried different things to try to corral it, and it, it still comes around. There must be a way found to regenerate a rescue man from his ruin. And God found a way. God made a way to reconcile man unto himself, and that was when God provided himself a lamb. Flip your Bibles over to Exodus chapter 12, and I want you to look at something here. And I want you to understand this this morning. I want you to see this, the importance of that lamb that was provided for you and me, the provisions of the lamb. If we go over into Exodus chapter 12, and here we are after, after the, uh, 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 Moses was getting ready to try to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, and, and the, the firstborn was going to die, and and they was going to be expelled from Egypt, and he was going to lead them out. But I want you to look at Exodus 12 here in verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for, a, for an house. And if the house be too little for the lamb... Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make, uh, shall make you count for the make you make you count for the lamb. And verse five says, "Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out of the sheep and from the goats." And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door post of the houses where they shall eat it. I want you to take a and think about this for a minute. He said, I want you to go and he said, I want you to take a lamb. And he said, I want that lamb to be without spot, spot and without blemish. He said, he said that down, he said, after 14 days, he said, then you're going to gather together and as a congregation and you're going to slay those lambs. He said, then you're going to take their blood and that blood from that lamb was basically put in a basin if you'd read on. And many times we think about, you know, when we think about what they did there in, 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 uh, in Exodus, there when, when, the, when they was putting the blood on the, on the doorpost. Most of us think of them going up there with a, with a bucket or a basin like this, and they take hyssop. That's what they're supposed to do. And they dip it in there, and they splash it on the, on the doorpost and over the, over the top sill. But if you really go back and you study what they did, and you find out the traditions what they did, they took a basin, and they set it at the base of the door. They took the hyssop, and they went down and they dipped it in the blood. And they went up and hit it here. They went over here and hit it here. They went over here and hit it here, forming a cross. Not realizing what they was doing. That was so that a picture of the Lamb that God would provide one day at Calvary for you and me. That precious blood. But I want you to look at something real close here in Exodus and how he describes the Lamb. If you look there in in verse 3, notice that he says, a lamb. Just look at it, it says, a lamb. 
Then look down at verse 4. It says, the Lamb. But look at verse 5. Your Lamb. You see, before I was saved, I knew about Jesus Christ. I'd heard about Jesus Christ when I was younger. And to me in my life, He was a Lamb. People talked about Him. But then as a teenager, God began to deal with my heart and I began to understand that He was the Lamb. The only Lamb. Amen. Not just a Lamb, but the Lamb. Amen. In the middle of May of 1975 on a Wednesday night, when I got up from that side and walked down that altar, I was saved before I reached the altar. Amen. And He became my Lamb. Amen. Some here this morning, He's just a lamb to you. You've heard about what He can do. Some, he, you're, you're convinced that yes, He is the Son of God. He is the lamb. He's the only way. But you've never made Him your lamb. All this morning, you need to make Him your lamb. Because without Him becoming your lamb, there is no remission of sin. God made a provision with the lamb. For you and me. That we might have eternal life. That we might have that which He has promised through His Son. God made that provision for, uh, for, for uh, you and I that we might have eternal life. Then I want you to consider the purity of the Lamb. Look at Exodus 12 there in verse 5 again. It says, Your Lamb shall be without blemish. The purity of that Lamb. You stop and think about it. He said, I want you to look at that lamb over. He said, I want to make sure that it has no spot, no blemish on it. And no doubt, uh, though, when they understood what the, what the importance of it, they looked, they would take that, that lamb and they had to, had to shut it up for, for a total of 14 days, two weeks. They would watch that lamb to make sure that he didn't stumble around. To make sure that they would watch him when he would walk across the, uh, uh, the corral. And they would make sure that he wasn't limping or hobbling. No doubt they would look and they would run their hands over that lamb to find out if there was any blemishes, any bumps or anything. I remember several years ago when I was a, was a teenager, we had a, had a cow and she had a calf. And, and that calf in the face was beautiful. But that calf couldn't stand up and had a big old knot come up by its neck and back. And wound up having to put that calf down. It had a blemish. And they would look at those lambs and they would make sure that there was no spot or no blemish. Nothing wrong with that lamb. They didn't just grab up any ordinary lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. And no doubt during that time those kids would come by and they would look at that lamb and, and maybe even name it. Not realizing that in a few days that lamb was going to be slain for them. No doubt that as they, they had that lamb there, maybe even the firstborn of a family would come by and begin to pet it. Not realizing that that lamb was going to save his life. It had to be without spot, without blemish. Can I tell you something? You and I, we have spots, we have blemishes. We cannot save ourselves. It took a sinless sacrifice, one without spot and without blemish, that we might have eternal life, that we might be saved through, through the shed blood of that perfect sacrifice. Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and he was speaking of Jesus Christ in verse 21, he said, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 
Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, he says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And notice what he says, Who did no sin. Who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. He committed no sin, said nothing wrong, told no lies, said, said nothing that would, could even be construed as, as evil. We find also that John, speaking of Jesus in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, And ye know that He was manifested to take away our sins. And then He said, And in Him is no Sin. He was pure. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, when the blood of Christ was shed at Calvary for you and me, it was pure. It was sinless blood. You can take Him any way that you want. You can watch Him. You can look at Him. And, and I've observed Him from His Word over the years. And, and you can observe Him and you can look at Him and you can think about Him. And there is no blemish. There is no spot. There is no sin. Pure. Never told a lie. Never had a bad thought. Never disobeyed his parents. Never took anything. Never hated. Boy, we can look at him, he's that sinless Savior. The purity of our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the only blood that could be accepted by God the Father to redeem fallen man was a sinless lamb without spot and blemish. Then I want you to notice about this lamb. Notice the person of the lamb. Isaiah 53, if you want to go there. And Isaiah 53 describes him and, and he gives us a clue to a little bit more to who he is. And Isaiah 53 says, verse 1 says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Verse 2 says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, that, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did open not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. If you look at that, it describes Jesus Christ. Who is this lamb? In verse 7 there, notice. Look at, or, uh, uh, look at verse 2, first of all. Here it says, for he shall grow up before him as, as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when he, we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. No sub says, for he shall grow up before him as a dry, tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. It speaks here of the virgin birth as a tender plant out of what? The dry ground. You can't go out here and without water grow something. You go out here and take just dry ground and, and, and plant it and keep it dry. It's not going to grow anything. It has to have moisture. And it's a picture actually of the virgin there as, as, hey, listen, she had not been with man. How could she have a child? But she did. The very Son of God. As a plant out of a tender, dry, a tender plant out of a dry ground. He grew up before him. 
You see, a lot of people, they don't realize that Jesus Christ was, was from the beginning, before there was the earth, before anything was created. Jesus was there, the Lamb, of the Son of God. Jesus Christ was from Genesis to Revelation. He's the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says, and, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him whose name is all written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before God even created this world, He had already predestined that His Son would die for you and me. He always was. He always will be. The Bible there says that He was without <clears throat> comeliness, that we wouldn't desire Him. That he, that he, and it says that uh, he was despised of men and, and a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He is, was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus Christ, as he hung on the cross, they, they mocked him and they jeered him and they laughed at him. He was despised. And he was rejected as the Son of Man. Who is this Lamb? It's Jesus Christ. Consider the purpose of the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verse 29 says, The next day John saith Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Can I tell you something this morning? Why did Jesus Christ come? It wasn't because of ego. It wasn't because of he, he wanted everybody to pat him on the back. But he came to take away the sins of the world. Your sin and my sin. I don't know about you, but I know myself and I am no good. I am undone. I am wicked. And I thank the Lord for His forgiveness of sin and His cleansing with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He came to take away the sins of the world. Some would say, well, preacher, I, I have went so far that there's no way that He can forgive me my sin. There's no way that He can save me. There's no way that He can uh, cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. My friend, I want you to understand something. He came to take away the sins of the world. Amen. And all I thank God for 1 John 1, 9. When we fail Him, when we, when we sin against Him, it's not just a goof up. It's not just a... a, 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 a uh, 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 an accident, but it's called sin. And when we sin against Him, we go to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter what it is. I remember sitting down with a lady one time and and she, she, was, she claimed to be saved, but she said, Oh, I can, the Lord can't forgive me of what I've done. And I said, It doesn't matter what you've done. The Lord can forgive you. He can wash it away. You just need to confess it and forsake it and, and turn to Him and, and, and leave it there and go on. My friend, understand this morning, it doesn't matter what it is. He came to take away the sins of the world. That's right. Jacob, before you was ever born, he knew everything about you. He knew every sin that you'd ever commit in your life before you were saved and after you were saved. And He can take away the sins of the world. Many times this old devil will come around and he's trying to beat you up and beat you down and say, well, see what you've done, see what you've done. You can't live for God. God can't forgive you. You're of no good anymore. I want you to understand something. The Lord already knew about you. Before He even saved you. And if you come to Him and you'll honestly pour out your heart to Him and, and, and ask for forgiveness, He will forgive. He's merciful. He came to take away the sins of the world. You say, well, preacher, what about, what about these murderers? And, and what about, what about the, the homosexuality? And what about the, the child uh, 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 perverts and stuff like that? He came to take away the sins of the world. Well, what a, what would you, well, well, okay, but what about Hitler? What if after he'd killed all those Jews, what if, what if he had turned and, and asked the Lord to forgive him, come to his heart, life, and save him? He came to take away the sins of the world. What about Obama? He came to take away the sins of the world. 
What about Bin Laden? He came to take away the sins of the world. What about Rodney Haggett? He came to take away the sins of the world. You see, for me to try to put myself in a different category than Hitler, Bin Laden, he came to take away the sins of the world. My friend, it doesn't matter whether you're president or whether you're flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. He came to take away the sins of the world. It doesn't matter. Many times we don't understand what he came for. Then once you consider how precious the Lamb is. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 it says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Because I want you to consider how precious he is. You know, if I was to come to your house, and, or you was to come to my house, and, and we begin to talk about things that are precious, what might be precious to you wouldn't necessarily be precious to me. And what might be precious to me might not be precious to you. But there's some things that we look at that causes things to be precious. One of them is this. One of them is the value of it. The value of it. And you begin to look at the value of Jesus Christ to you and I. That He would come, that He might take away the sins of the world. That's pretty precious. When you look at that shed blood, how precious it is. It was sinless blood. Do you realize that there is no other sinless blood? It's a rarity. And Jesus Christ is the only one that has ever had sinless blood. And died with it. Oh, when it started, Adam and Eve, there was no sin. But that blood became tainted because of sin, and they, eventually they died with sin, uh, with uh, uh, sinful blood. But Jesus Christ, uh, He's precious because that blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God is precious because there's nothing like Him. There's no one like Him. He's unique. He's, he's precious because of His uniqueness. He's precious because of, uh, of His value. He's precious because, hey listen, uh, uh, because of the love of God towards Him. His heavenly Father in Matthew 13, or, uh, uh, Matthew 3, 17 said, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Precious. Precious because of the salvation that He's provided. Precious because of the memories of the goodness that He has shown towards man. You know, there's a song, Precious Memories, but I'll tell you what, you begin to think about this morning, you begin to think about what Jesus Christ did for you and me, and it is precious. There's can, nothing can replace that. There's absolutely nothing can replace that salvation that He has given you and I. And I look at what He did, and I don't deserve salvation, but He saved me. That's precious. Yeah. I can call unto Him, and He will answer, and show me great and mighty things which I know not. That's precious that I can talk to my Savior. Amen. He is unique. He's one of a kind. He loves you and me. He loves us so much that He died at Calvary. For, there's, one of the things that makes uh, something precious is the love that is shown towards that thing. Or that thing showing towards you. What makes Him precious in your life and my life is His love towards us. He has never failed anyone in this room. Not once. But I'm going to tell you something. Every person in this room, including this preacher, has failed Him over and over and over again. But you know what the, the precious thing about that is? Is that He is willing to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's precious. The Lamb of God is precious. There's some things that cannot be replaced, and that's why they become precious. I heard him talking about the, 
the things out there where the, the Bundy brothers are and those other men there in Oregon up there at that, on that uh, wildlife refuge thing. And, and they was talking about the, the different uh, Indian artifacts and stuff that was in there and they was worrying about because they cannot be replaced. They said there's no value can be put upon them. Can I tell you something? That there's nothing that can replace. There's nothing that can, can there's no value can be put on the love of God. Amen. It is precious this morning. Oh, to know that He reaches down and He cares for you and me. And, and you may be having a, a bad day and going through a difficult time and may be discouraged. And He'll just slip in and, and throw His arm around you and pull you up close and say, it's going to be all right. And He loves you. And oh, how precious that is to, to know that He's there when you need Him. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's precious. Precious. The darkest hours of your life, He's there. And he's precious. My friend, you look at a person who's li that knows Christ as their Savior and has lived for the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're laying on their deathbed, and you go up to them and say, what do you think about Jesus? And they'll say, precious. 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 I'll never forget my mom. A few days before she died, laying there on that bed, and she woke up and she said, oh, no. So what's the matter, Mom? She said, I'm still here. I'm still here. And I'll never forget that one day, right before she died, she told stepdad, she told him, she said, you see those, see those butterflies? He said, no, hell, I don't see no butterflies. She said, those right over there, those monarch butterflies. It's in January. Cold out. He said, no. She said, that's okay. She said, when you see one, remember me. And I think those butterflies was just the Lord saying, I'm getting ready. He's precious, even at a time of the last hours of your life. Wouldn't trade, you wouldn't trade something that's precious. You wouldn't give it up because of its preciousness to you. Then I want you to consider the power of the Lamb. In Revelations chapter 5, and verse 1 says, And I saw the, in the right hand him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, Sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And notice what it says in verse 3. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, were able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And John said, And I wept much. Because no man was found worthy to open the book, to open the book and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said, saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God, sent forth into the, all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them a harp of gold and vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us to, unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. No one was able, no one was powerful enough to open the book except the Lamb. No one in heaven, that's the angels. No one on earth, no one under the earth. You see, the Lamb 
has all power. Given to him by his Father. And absolutely no one can stand before him. Father, the wood and the fire. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Can I ask you this morning, where's the lamb in your life? Where's he at? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, come and receive him. He went to Calvary and shed that precious blood for you and me. And he rose again the third day that we might have eternal life. But my friend, you must accept him. You must repent and receive him as your Savior. Let the Lord have his way in your life. And Christian, this morning... He's precious. And oh, how our hearts ought to be stirred to live for Him, to follow Him, to love Him, to worship Him. Abraham said this. He told the two young men, he said, we go over there to that mountain over there to worship. You stay here. He said, we'll be back. Because in his heart, he knew that God was able to even raise up his son and bring him back. Sometimes you've got to separate and go to worship. And you've got to give everything you've got and put him first to go worship. My friend, when you get there, he's already provided the lamb. He's already there. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for that lamb, the lamb of God. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to draw near unto you and to follow you to magnify you. Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ their Savior, I pray that they would come. I'll meet them here in the front. We'll take a Bible. We'll show them how to be saved. Lord, I pray that every Christian here would realize him how precious, oh Lord, how precious the Lamb is. A Lamb without spot, without blemish. And He's all power. And he's coming again. Help us to live for you. To worship you. With this we pray in Jesus name.